Welcome to those of you that are joining us. Um, we're just going to give it a few minutes. I hear there's a storm in uh, Johannesburg and um, we might have people dialing in from all over the world. So we'll give that a little bit of time um, before we kick off. So if you would like to, please uh, take a deep breath, try and get into the room of the webinar. I invite you to put everything that's been keeping you busy today aside before the Friday close and the weekend starts. Okay, I think we can get going. It's um, 34 minutes past two. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. Um, so when we get to the Q&A, um, just note that it is being recorded um, in case you want to clearly indicate uh, that this is your position or your organization's position for the recording purposes. Right, so. Uh, my screen should be coming up soon. I need a nod to check that people are seeing my screen. Ha, great. Okay. Uh, right, so welcome. Um, I hope you're finding yourselves in the right place. My name is um, Togozile Madonko, also known as Togo. And I'm with the Heinrich Boll Foundation. I'm actually sitting in for my colleague um, who runs the sustainability program in the foundation. I manage the international politics um, and dialogue program. And um, the Heinrich Boll Foundation is a, is a German political foundation. And uh, we are affiliated loosely to the Green Party. Um, and if you're interested, in knowing more about our work, I'd be happy to, to touch base with you at another time. Um, we're also very happy to be uh, collaborating with the African Climate Foundation today. And I'm hoping that uh, 
they'll be able to give us some input um, on the work that they do um, and the engagements that they make. But if you are interested in their work, please again, uh, look them up on the African Climate Foundation on their website. And um, a few of the representatives from that organization are online. Um, and so you can direct any questions to them. But I'm really also excited to welcome our three speakers today to really have a moment this very, where I am at the moment, very hot <laughs> Friday afternoon, rethinking economics in the age of extinction, um, a Green New Deal for South Africa. And um, we are also looking a little bit and reflecting on uh, the South African budget uh, that was just tabled 2022 uh, before Parliament. Please remember that it's an executive uh, proposal. It will be debated in Parliament um, and debated at the provincial level. It is not cast in stone because we do have amendment powers in South Africa, but it is always also good to have some kinds of reflection on what does this framework look like? What does it mean? Uh, where are we going post the pandemic? So um, without taking up too much time and finding my notes very quickly. We have Fadal Kaboub, who is an Associate Professor of Economics at Denison and President of the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity. And he has a long teaching career and uh, many research affiliations and um, is really bringing to the, the table a rethinking or a a reimagining of the way in which we talk about e economics, the way in which we talk about um, monetary policy, fiscal policy, and um, again, how we talk about climate change and the environment. So I'm really happy to have Fadal here. And when he has a moment, one of the questions he was asked in preparation for this webinar was, what is one of his favorite quotes? So he can throw that into the chat um, so that you know what keeps him inspired. Uh, to keep going. Then we have Sonia Palazze, who is a climate and feminist activist from the Institute for Economic Justice. Um, she has plenty of degrees from South African universities, and her current focus is on feminist economics and the role of the state and private financing for development and climate justice. So she is definitely in the right space, and she is one of the co-conveners of the feminist economics summer school, and I really hope we'll get a chance to bring that into our conversation today. So welcome, Sonia. And then, Sonia, when you have a moment, can you pop in your favorite uh, inspiring quote? It was question number five in the questions that I sent to you. So when you have a moment, you can throw it in the chat. We have Michael Sachs, um, who works, who teaches and does research on economics, public policy and politics in South Africa. Uh, for some very interesting reasons, since we don't know of his past, he was the National Treasury's head of the National Treasury Budget Office. Um, he has uh, an in-depth insight into the workings of the African National Congress and is currently leading the Public Economy Project, a research initiative based at the Wits University Southern Center for Inequality Studies. And he's also the Deputy Chair of the Finance and Fiscal Commission. So again, welcome, Michael, um, and thank you so much for joining us. So for those of you that are uh, watching or listening, please just do the clap hands or a little acknowledgement for our speakers. Um, I know that I've been a little bit stressed about preparing for this. So let's, let's uh, make them feel welcome today. So the welcome and aim is really for us to build awareness of pluralist economic approaches or alternative economic approaches to addressing the climate emergency. So we're not here to tell you everything, but to start creating a conversation and a discussion about what it is we need collectively when talking about the age of extinction, the Green New Deal, um, and what it means to live in this world that we find ourselves in. We're also inviting engagement on what would constitute a Green New Deal in South Africa. And one of the key learnings that um, came out of an internal review that we did as the foundation with our partners was that a really powerful tool that we can use in trying to imagine 
or design or act um, in relation to the crises we face is to be uncomfortable and comfortable with unfinished things. So it might, we might not find an answer today, but hopefully we can find answers going forward. I also encourage you to share your questions, your ideas and thoughts for next steps. But before we begin, it would be remiss of me not to mention the, the, the current um, unfolding and situation in Europe, in Ukraine. Um, already just listening to the 12 o'clock news, uh, they had speakers on talking about the economic impact that this crisis is going to have on the South African economy. But we also know that war anywhere affects everyone. And interestingly enough, when we're talking about a Green New Deal or climate change, one of the biggest issues that came out of COP26 last year was the role of militaries in their carbon emissions. And so again, we're reminded to ask very important questions about when public resources are used um, to kill or maim or hurt others, at what cost um, and for whose future. So again, uh, we encourage you to think about and engage in the debates around expenditures on the military industrial complex, carbon emissions, um, and do we really want to be talking about a greener military? Like these are the kinds of things that we need to, to be engaging with. And of course, our hearts and thoughts go out to our colleagues, friends uh, living in and around Ukraine. So I would like you to please introduce yourselves on the chat function um and just say your name and which organization or where you're based please and then for a very quick moment to just close your eyes step away from your laptop uh, even encourage our speakers to do this and if it's safe to do so and quickly enter this webinar there might be storms raging but just take a moment close your eyes take a deep breath And then maybe you need to just check in. How much energy do I have on a scale of one to 10? I know I'm above firecracker at the moment. And so hopefully that's interesting and encouraging uh, webinar. Again, please post your questions and thoughts. Uh, please be polite, uh, use appropriate language. Um, and this will help us to improve our, our offering if you also can participate in the two polls that you'll see in the process of this webinar. So the way we have designed it, it will be a conversation between the speakers uh, with a number of questions by me, but really we want to have time for the Q&A so that we can surface and engage with these critical questions of our age. So we encourage you to remember that relationships are everything. We don't have to agree, but we can engage in ways that are mutually reinforcing and supportive. So state your views, ask genuine questions, use specific examples where necessary. I didn't do that so much with the carbon emissions for, for the military, but I had like, I can give you references. Share time so all can participate, explain reasoning and intent, test assumptions and inferences. So just think, like, what are you saying? What does this mean? Um, I'm, I'm curious about this point. And importantly, please challenge the idea and not the person. And let's jointly design next steps. And really, let's have fun. So it's useful to know that we have a climate change policy context in South Africa. Um, and it's always useful to just have a sense of what our international commitments are, um, the national development plan and how it makes reference to it, but also they are sectoral policies and strategies. And so I'm assuming that many of you that are on this call today are looking at this both from a budget and a, a climate change lens at different levels and different spheres of government. Um, and so it is important for us to locate ourselves within this broader macro picture, 
but also there are aspects of the policy framework that are relevant to you. We might not touch on all of them, um, but we do recognize that this is an important lens for us to engage with. So budget 22. So just um, very briefly, some of the thoughts I had when preparing for today was that we agree that COVID-19 has posed new questions for economic policymakers around the world. And it's demanding a rethink of fiscal and monetary policy to fundamentally restructure our economies. And it's often argued that the dominant current approaches tend to place an emphasis on stable levels of economic growth, employment, inflation, balance of payment deficits and budget deficits, all geared towards creating a conducive environment for market mechanisms or private sector to expand production and grow the economy. And part of our conversation today will be unpacking some of this. So if these terms are new or you're not familiar with them, just say definition in the chat. And at some point, if not in this webinar, we will try and make sure that um, we have clear, uh, you have a, a clear understanding of what some of these terms mean, or at least you know where to, to access more information. Monetary policy has likewise focused on creating a conducive environment for market activity, particularly financial markets, focusing on inflation targeting. So it was very interesting when they were talking about Ukraine, they said immediately food prices are going to be impacted on, um, which was very interesting. So I had to force myself not to give my analysis of budget 2022, because it's not appropriate. I wasn't asked to do that. I was asked to facilitate. Um, so the question really is underneath this, what then is South Africa's fiscal and monetary policy? And do we have a Green New Deal? So our, wor our worlds matter. Oh, sorry. There's a poll that you can as come up that you can use, at, that you can answer. So very quickly, our worlds matter, our meanings matter. So in preparing for this, um, and this was both a request uh, by um, some colleagues of mine when I was talking about what should I do, how should I do this, we often throw terms around and we're not very good at defining what we mean by that term. And so, you know, we could all say austerity, but are we talking about the, the same thing? Uh, somebody said, now there's private green growth. What does that mean versus a Green New Deal? So just to keep in the back of our minds as much as possible, that when we're using particular types of terms, these are just examples. I really like nature positive economy. Um, it was new to me that we just pop in, what do you mean? What, what, what does that mean for you? Um, and, and, and why does it matter um, in relation to, to what we're talking about? Okay, so that's the end of me. And everybody agrees that South Africa needs to rethink its own economic approach in the age of extinction. So, oh, that was my favorite quote, but I've run out of time. Okay, I'll pop it into the chat. Right, so I will now turn to our panel. So I'm gonna kick off with uh, the person who's the furthest away from us in terms of time zones, um, just to kickstart, mainly to as a nod for waking up so early. So Fadel, um, what is your vision of a Green New Deal and for South Africa um, as a developmental state delivering on its developmental objectives? Well, thank you again for, for hosting us today and for uh, organizing this uh, webinar. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, for me, a, a Green New Deal uh, is, uh, does a couple of things uh, in the context of uh, a country like South Africa. Number one, it has to be transformative in the sense that it decarbonizes the economy, builds more resilience to external shocks, not just to shocks related to climate change. Uh, external shocks, shocks can be related to climate change, affecting food prices, affecting prices of uh, key necessities that the country imports. And it can also affect 
prices negatively for key exports for the country. So building that resilience to external shocks. Um, number two, it, it should be transformative in the sense that it creates a much more prosperous, uh, just and um, equitable uh, economy and, and society. And number three, and most importantly, it should be uh, a, a system of not just growth for its own sake. Uh, there's the old saying that growth for its own sake is the ideology of a cancer cell, but it should be based on uh, achieving certain macroeconomic goals. Well, that could be green growth, that could be resilience, but doing it in a way that doesn't bankrupt the country, doesn't add to external debt, and doesn't exacerbate inflation pressure points which means designing the Green New Deal or any kind of New Deal has to be done with an eye towards taming the sources of inflation pressure points, taming the sources that exacerbate external debt and transforming the structure of the economy. And of course, doing it in the context of decarbonizing and building more resilience. For me, that's, that's probably the most comprehensive way I would like to think of a, of a Green New Deal and anything that, that carries the label Green New Deal because it's a popular label these days and doesn't touch on these three points, to me could be uh, actually a, a dangerous hijacking of the label because uh, many people see the Green New Deal as investing in green things left and right, spending a lot of money with, with good um, uh, kind of, uh, with high expectations for, transforming the system, but not doing it in a way that's targeted, that in a way that's uh, aiming at producing an, an actually resilient and stable system ecologically, socially, and, and economically. So I'll leave it at that. Great, thanks so much, Fidel. Um, Sonia. Thanks, um, and- Same thank question. You <laughs> <laughs> thank you for inviting me. Um, you know, I think after Wednesday's budget and the state of a uh, state of the nation address, I I would be a little hesitant to call South Africa a developmental state. Um, you know, the president himself seems to have shifted the task of generating employment um, onto the private sector, um, and Treasury very much supported that sentiment by focusing mostly on on business interests. I would argue, um, but we can get back into that um, a little later. Um, in terms of a, of a Green New Deal in South Africa, I mean, I largely, actually, I wholly agree with what Fidel has, has, has said. Um, I would add a few things, you know, my vision is first and foremost, you know, about a strong, capable state that is um, concerned with the provision of public infrastructure. You know, after the, the onset of the pandemic in early 2020, many activists were pointing to the ways um, the climate crisis intersects with the economic crisis um, and the reasons why many countries do not have the adequate health infrastructure, you know, after decades of austerity um, because, you know, the hollowing out of core public services. Um, so the, the pandemic, I think, gives us, gave us a painful glim glimpse into the ways in which our economy will be unable to protect millions, um, millions from ecological destruction in the future. And I think a big part of that is, is this idea of a capable state um, that is, at this point, not providing sustainable, accessible public infrastructure. Secondly, I think, uh, a Green New Deal should leverage, can you hear me? It says that the network is, um, okay, I think a, a Green New Deal should also leverage on the current kind of global green tide, you know, to use this moment to really rethink the structure of our, of our economy, like Fidel mentioned, you know, it, it should be centered on sectoral diversification that is aimed at addressing the climate and, and ecological um, crises. Um, and actively kind of transitions away from the economy's dependence on, on, on what is called this mineral energies, min, minerals energy complex. Um, and I think this needs a much stronger macroeconomic framework that is, that is very serious about meeting human rights and focuses on well-being and not only for growth's sake. Um, um, and third, you know, my, 
the, another aspect of my vision is um, is about having a deal that is is care centered um, and is and is concerned with challenging the social reproductive crisis in South Africa. And for those who don't know, social reproduction is basically the work you know of caring. Um, you know, it's it's the work of caring for other human beings. It's the work of giving birth. It's the work of feeding. It's the work of clothing, um, and in the capitalist economy, um, often we they it's the social reproductive section is separated completely from production. Um, but we know that we cannot have a labor force, um, or the labor force would not exist without um, social reproductive work. Um, and in this sense, social reproduction is also quite gendered, um, with women performing the vast majority of this work. Um, and while much of the social reproductive work happens inside the home and is largely unpaid, other elements of it happen in what is called the care economy, which is the work done by teachers, nurses, you know, care work that is done in creches and care homes. Um, and all of these jobs, as we know, are typically also low paid. Um, again, this is also gendered work. Um, and so our current macroeconomic framework, which I'll keep coming to, I think doesn't recognize the value of the work done within the household. Um, and so in the pursuit of austerity, which has you know, seen the hollowing out of basic services, as I mentioned, um, it means that the, high, the burden of care work and a much higher burden of care work is placed in households. So, you know, when there are no good schools or when the schools are shut down, um, like we saw under the pandemic, um, um, under the lockdown rather, um, the increase in this work, um, the burden of this work was actually shifted onto the household. Um, so to close off, you know, I want to end by saying that um, the ecological crisis is a structural crisis and unless policymakers are thinking critically about addressing kind of the structural problems or fault lines in our economy, then we will not adequate, we will not be adequately addressed or uh, prepared rather for the climate crisis. And so I see um, a Green New Deal as an, as an opportunity to not build back better, which is, is the ongoing saying, it's, it's how can we build forward differently? Thanks. Great. And on the build forward differently, um, Michael, as somebody who has an intimate understanding of the South African macroeconomic and fiscal framework, um, what are your thoughts and what is your vision for a Green New Deal? Um, I'm only starting to think about it is the honest truth. And uh, uh, I, it strikes me that uh, I found it interesting that there's nothing so far that Fadel or Sonia have said uh, that I disagree with, even in the slightest bit. Uh, I think we would all agree on a kind of process of development that is transformative, leads to more resilience, prosperity, justice, equity, and, and uh, uh, capable state and, 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 and the things that have been said. So I want to try and uh, be not controversial, but, but I'm not sure what a Green New Deal means in South Africa. I, I, have a, I have a fear about what a Green New Deal means for South Africa. And that is that a Green New Deal means a very large external shock uh, in the sense that uh, we, we have, I mean, one of the interesting things in the budget last week, it was the first time I heard the language of uh, government intends to raise the price of carbon to $20 a ton for in the next few years and then $30 a ton a, a, a few years beyond that. And as I mean, uh, others here will know better about this than I, but I have a sense that that is far, far below the ambition that is being set in, in the rest of the world in terms of the price of carbon. So we will be facing, in a sense, a very large price shock. Why? Because our economy uh, is the most carbon intensive in the world, I think. 
I don't know if that's true, but you'll correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sure it's, it's amongst the most, I think in per capita terms, we're, we're, we're right there up at the top. And our, our social and economic problems are rooted in a capital stock that is, which we can uh, call a mineral and energy complex, which is highly carbon intensive. And the, the, the process of, of decarbonization implies a period, imp, implies essentially that that capital stock will become prematurely redundant. In other words, when the investments were made in, let's say, the two very large coal powered fire stations that we, are, we have just recently completed, the assumption behind the financing of those power stations was that these power stations will generate electricity that will be sold to the public for the next 30 to 60 years. And now we face the reality that we we're going to have to close them before that. So it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's a premature obsolescence, not only of those power stations, but of this entire capital stock that constitutes the mineral and energy complex. And what we will need to do to decarbonize is to invest significant resources, therefore, not in expanding the capital stock, increasing it, but simply replacing the existing capital stock with a new capital stock. That doesn't really, and, and the new capital stock, it's a new technology, uh, renewable energy technology as an input, but the output it produces is just the same. It's, it's electricity. It doesn't kind of fundamentally change the logic of the economy. And so, and this new capital stock is likely, or there's debates about this, but it, it may well be, less labor intensive. And the labor that it does demand might be more of high skilled labor. So that's the one kind of reality that is that I find worrying that I think the transition to uh, uh, net zero is being so far presented to us as though it were a yellow brick road, as though it were something that only has upsides. But a kind of history tells us that economic transformations of this nature are very painful and, uh, and have a lot of risks associated with them. And I think we're only at the beginning in South Africa of beginning to understand what are those risks and what are those dislocations that are likely to be associated with decarbonization and thinking about how we deal with that. So that's kind of my first point. My second point is that, and maybe I'm, I'm now laying the ground for, for, for a, more, a debate about things like fiscal and monetary policy is that the position we find ourselves in right now is that no demand stimulus policy can work in South Africa. Why? Because uh, even with this low level of demand that we have now, we are unable to generate the energy we require to run the economy. So as I was sitting here, I was briefly load shed on, on the WITS University campus. I'm not sure if it was ESCOM or Joburg or WITS, but well, it's back now. But we have load shedding. We have load shedding in a context of declining GDP per capita, which is what has been happening over the last 10 years. And the idea that you can stimulate demand uh, and grow the economy on a sustainable basis, therefore, it's kind of difficult to accept because any accelerated rate of growth will uh, quickly run into this uh, energy constraint. So I would think, so, so, so maybe my first point is about the kind of longer term trajectory of, of, of the transition to, to, to net zero. But 
as medium term macroeconomic policy, the central issue that we need to address and we need to find ourselves, uh, we need to build a consensus around in South Africa, is how do we unlock uh, this energy constraint uh, on our growth? And we do so in a context, not like many countries in Europe or the US and, and, and that, that have uh, gone through 20 or 30 years of neoliberal reforms in the energy sector. We do so from a position where the state, a single state monopoly presides over the entire electricity supply industry and has done uh, since the 1930s. And it is that state uh, agency or that state ownership that has led us into this position we find ourselves now of, of uh, uh, load shedding and insufficient energy. So I think we need, I suppose then in conclusion, the, 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 what we need to do is bring this whole debate uh, to South Africa, because at the moment, it's an American debate, it's a European debate, and I think the, the, the implications and the way we think about it is going to be very different in South Africa, but we haven't yet really started to grapple with that. Thanks, Michael. And I know there was quite a few terms um, being thrown around and I've been watching the, the Q&A and in fact, stranded assets that Fadal put in came up in the, the budget review. Um, and I think, you know, we've really been, it's almost the, the vision I have at the moment is this very murky set of pots. There's the vision of care work being centered, probably a feminist economy, uh, a nature positive um, engagement, maybe different ideas of growth, maybe different ideas of sovereignty, agency. And then we have the current um, scenario that Michael has painted very strongly for us around, well, this, this is the current setup. Um, and these are the things that we need to be worried about in this pot. Um, and how do we bridge these differing components? So I just want to, to uh, quickly, um, chat a little bit, uh, Sonia, from, from what uh, you heard from Michael in terms of what he was talking about. And now I might move around your questions. So I hope you can shuffle your papers fast enough. Um, you've done, you've written a lot, Sonia, on the role of private finance, private sector-led infrastructure development in South Africa. And I thought your point about saying, and, and in some ways pushing back on my question, are we really a developmental state? In relation to these pots that I'm sort of seeing us grappling with and Michael's input, um, is there a place for private finance, private sector led infrastructure development in South Africa? Can we place them into the pot of a care economy, different notions of growth, different notions of, of, of living in some ways? Or, and how do we make sense of the current pot that is the minerals industrial complex, um, which many would say coalesces into the, the uh, prison military industrial complex, be it locally, you know, regionally or globally. Thanks. I mean, you know, just on, on Michael's point on, um, on South Africa having a minerals energy complex um, and how this center of our economy is quite capital intensive. What we, what we often don't want to acknowledge is that this has also led to a very highly financialized economy um, that has also in many ways um, led to the deindustrialization of our economy. So I think, you know, we need to think very carefully about, I mean, I agree with some of the points he made, but I think we also need to think carefully about how do we, um, sequence, which is kind of what Michael is also referring to, but how do we transition away from this complex? And I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to hear uh, Michael's thoughts on that. Um, to your question, um, Togo, I think, yes, I will say there is a place for private finance. I, I am at odds with, with the so-called recovery or this developmental trajectory being a private sector-led um, um, trajectory or 
or what the government call an infrastructure develop, a private sector infrastructure um, development, simply because you know the main difference between privately produced infrastructure and 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 publicly provided infrastructure is that public infrastructure is fully financed by the government is is not built to meet a bottom line, um, and so it's 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 built to be universally accessible, um, and I think you know, going to my point earlier, you know, quality, universally accessible public infrastructure, as we know, also has less of a carbon footprint than, for example, individuals relying on private assets um, like cars. Um, and so, you know, the budget mentioned quite a bit about PPPs and, and blended finance um, as key vehicles through which will provide infrastructure. And for those who don't know, you know, a PPP or public private um, partnership um, and blended finance are just finan financing vehicles um, that enroll both the state and the private sector um, into financing a large asset. Um, but in this case, in the case of PPPs and blended finance, um, you know, you'll hear the treasury say things like they'll invest only in bankable projects. And what does bankability mean? Bankability means we'll only invest in projects that are profitable. And so I worry about what we're focusing on, right? A PPP investment is geared toward, a bankable PPP investment is geared towards making a profit and it doesn't have a direct developmental objective. So for example, you know, a PPP investment in a water pipe project would not be concerned with ensuring that all communities, all surrounding communities um, around this water pipe um, have access to water, um, but would instead, first and foremost, factor into its analysis whether the project will make money, meaning it is, it's, it's likely the project won't even be built in a rural area because you know, those communities can't even afford it. And so what's concerning about this is that you know, the role of government in these financial vehicles is effectively to de-risk the infrastructure investment. So to make it easier for the private investor to invest and not necessarily to make it affordable or accessible. Um, and so to link this point to this idea of, of private climate finance, for example, you know, global financial actors have, have realized that global financial stability depends on addressing the climate emergency. And so climate finance um, climate private finance in particular has also been co-opted into what is called um, the Wall Street consensus, which, which is a key feature of kind of the dominant macroeconomic framework. You know, it allows private financiers to exploit the climate, the climate crisis um, for profitable opportunities um, that benefits mostly the financial market. And I think this poses particular risks for a country like South Africa, which, you know, because of this MEC um, is also highly financialized um, and is embedded in a highly financialized global system um, on very subordinate terms. So should there be a need to look for international finance, I think, or private finance, I think we need to focus um, a lot more on concessional financing, on, on, on low interest rates, on grants, um, but, you know, I'm not throwing the baby out of the bathwater. I'm not saying that private finance is completely like out of the question. I think there are ways of, you know, of enrolling private finance into, into these, these debates. I'll, I'll end there. Thanks, Sonia. And I mean, that's also part of the conversation around business and human rights um, in, in terms of the, the movements or at least the pressure to start getting um, the private sector to take on board um, their role in making sure that we can live healthier lives in the long term. Um, and so part of the, you know, I had a, an insight when I was listening to the budget speech was that it would be so good if we could have a business representative give their budget speech so that we could know how much money are they going to make over the fiscal year? How much are they going to pay workers over the fiscal year? What are they doing to um, improve uh, the lived experience of people, whether it's in this current macroeconomic fiscal framework or in a, some you know, lovely future better framework um, that we want to rethink or, or design. Um, but I think there's a place for beginning to see more clearly the role 
um, of both sides. Um, and this budget, in my mind, the, the, the one that was presented, really required a response from, from, the, private from the private sector because they're being given so many uh, subsidies and breaks. So Fadel, is somebody who- there's some people who might say that a business representative did give the budget speech. <laughs> yes. I'm not one of them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I still want to know what their super profits are going to be. So, um, so what I wanted to ask, um, Fadal, because you you kind of you've you've come uh, been engaging more and more with South Africa, and um, as you all don't know this, but I needed to do some major swatting in relation to these three individuals to hear what they've been talking about and saying over time. And so um, I'm beginning to hear some themes from both Sonia and Michael that you've been touching on. And maybe you could talk a little bit about, um, make sure I, I don't go completely off. Yeah, so you've spoken, um, and I think it's the caution in Michael's uh, account of, yes, in talking about a Green New Deal, how do we talk about what we currently have and what and how do we make sense of it? Um, and then Sonia just touching on the role that private finance can play in, in, in this transition of whatever form it takes. And you've really spoken about, you've said that most African countries' economies suffer from three structural deficiencies. So these are things that are built into uh, these, these countries' economies. The lack of food sovereignty, so the ability to grow their own food. Uh, interestingly enough, Namibia depends almost 90% on South Africa for food. Uh, the lack of energy sovereignty um, and the low value added content of exports relative to imports. So, I mean, in some ways, Michael gave that chat and Sonia has said the minerals industrial complex as well. So how are we going to get out of this trap? What's what's the thinking that you've been playing around with um, in, in the work that you've been doing? Well, uh, there's been a, a lot of really interesting points that uh, Michael and, and Sonia has have uh, put on the table for us. So let, let me start where I usually start, which is on a global scale, because this is really not a problem that that is exclusive to South Africa or exclusive to developing countries. We have a climate crisis and, and we have a relatively short amount of time to intervene on a massive scale if we're going to put a dent in this, in this crisis. I'll give you just one number um, uh, that would be relevant here. The United Nations Environmental Program produced a report a few years ago, three or four years ago, called the production gap. And it's the production of fossil fuels. And it's got a very simple graph, very simple statistic based on how much countries are actually planning to produce in terms of fossil fuels versus how much we should be producing and burning in order to meet the two, two degree uh, target or the 1.5 Celsius uh, uh, degree uh, target. And the gap is massive. And there is no way to close that gap unless we engage in this massive decarbonization. Um, so we have a serious challenge and everything that Michael said in terms of how we do that on a rapid scale, on a massive transformative scale, without you know, bankrupting countries, without causing so many of these dis dislocations that, that Michael described. So that's kind of the intellectual, academic, policy research question that we need to engage in. Um, number two, when we look at who's been kind of who carries the most responsibility for the climate damage that, we've, that we're dealing with. It's clearly the global north. When you look at CO2 emissions since the industrial revolution, it's clearly the global north, not the global south, not the African continent. Even in, when you take into account more recent developments with China and India and some of the emerging countries really increasing substantially their CO2 emissions, it's really, when you look at it from a consumption perspective, most of that CO2 emissions is really for consumption in the global north. So we have kind of a moral ethical responsibility to pay for the climate debt. Um, that is paying for it, not just in terms of monetary transfer and compensation to the global south, but transfer of technology and transformation of economies that are trapped in these structural deficiencies that I, that I described, uh, lack of food sovereignty, lack of energy sovereignty. So for example, when, when Michael described the need for additional energy production in South Africa to grow the economy and this 
prosperous and equitable economy. Where will the technology come from? Renewable energy technology. Well, it's, it's you need technology transfers, but even if you wanted to produce the technology locally in South Africa, you wanted to produce green hydrogen or solar or the technology itself, even if you get you know free licenses from Germany, from China, from the US to produce the technology yourself, that is an industrialization in and of itself. And every time you talk about industrialization and manufacturing, you can also hit another trap, which is you can't really industrialize a particular segment of your economy if you have, if, if you can't hit economies of scale, which means you need to produce on a larger scale than what you need, which means you need to produce for export. So now you're facing the situation where you have to compete with German and American and Japanese and Chinese technology. So we have to rethink the global international trade system so that when we say the global south is going to industrialize on a greener platform with transfer of technology with external financing from the global north that is a lot of ifs right then even then you have to set up the industrial structure that can actually hit those economies of scale and meet production targets so that we do the rapid decarbonization and then finally, what I would like to comment on, which is the, the issue of stranded assets and uh, that Michael described earlier and, and a few people in the chat are, are referring to. And I think this is very relevant to um, uh, electricity production in particular, but, but other things. As the world starts to decarbonize on a much more rapid uh, pace, what we're going to see is that oil and gas and coal infrastructure that is being built today billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars of CapEx expenditures, capital expenditures that are being put in place right now is going to become irrelevant, redundant, or what we call stranded assets, because everything that is being built today is with the expectation of being a productive asset for 30, 40, in some cases, 50 years. But we're saying we're going to shut it down in three years or five years or 10 years or immediately, which means you're throwing this capital expenditure, you know, in, in, in the toilet, essentially. And for me, it's very important political uh, question. It's not just a financial question, because investors who are buying those assets, investing in those assets, financial institutions that have those assets on their books as, as financial assets, will be facing a major financial shock. This is what we call the carbon bubble. It's like a, a market bubble, a financial market bubble, but it's related to carbon. To me, every uh, oil and gas CEO, every prime minister, president, government that's actually signing and giving licenses and approval to invest in additional productive capacity, especially in oil and gas and, and coal, is essentially doing one of two things. They're either signing our collective suicide pact because they know what the consequences are, given what we know about climate change, or they're intentionally duping investors into buying and investing in stranded assets. And as a result, all of us collectively, especially financial institutions and investors, pension funds, retirement funds, all of these funds that are actually trading and buying all of these potential stranded assets will be facing the consequences. So this is a political question, a moral, ethical question and a financial problem, in addition to it being a real productive capacity challenge that we have to deal with. And then finally, I'll close with um, yet another comment that uh, both Sonia and, uh, and, uh, and Michael mentioned, which is, if we are serious about this transformation for a caring economy, sustainable, resilient economy, then we have to remember our lessons from earlier massive transformations that we've lived through throughout the world. Since the Industrial Revolution, there's been one constant factor that the Industrial Revolution introduced and you know, presumably this fourth Industrial Revolution is reminding us of, which is all new technologies will always displace labor. And you, know, you remember the Luddites and the early days of the Industrial Revolutions, they break into factories to destroy the evil machines that are taking away their jobs. But what we've done and what we've learned from that transformation is that we always create new industries and new products and new job opportunities. But 
the constant factor is that those new jobs always require higher levels of education and technical skills, which means if we are to prepare for a substantial transformation of the kind that we're about to experience, hopefully, then we can't neglect investment in education and technical training. We can't throw people under the bus and expect them mid-career to you know, move away from coal mining and move to San Francisco, learn how to code and become an artificial intelligence expert. So that's the role of education, investing in education and technical training so that we know what targets we're aiming for on the production side and we invest in the productive capacity to staff those industries without neglecting uh, any segment of, of the economy. And then the, the, I, I keep saying the last thing. This is really the last thing I want to say because I, I know there's a lot of points here. The last thing to keep in mind is when we think about budgeting for these things, we often focus on the short term. We focus on the, on the dollars and cents, so to speak, um, of, of the budget. But we sort of neglect to think about the cost of doing nothing. Right. Think about it in a, in a kind of common sense way. The cost of doing nothing when it comes to decarbonizing the economy, investing in clean energy, clean water sources, and so on. Uh, we, we think of it as, well, this is too expensive. We can't afford it. It requires a lot of financing. Let's think about it later. But then we don't think about the millions of people that we're going to have to take care of in the future because they have asthma, because they have cancer, because we've neglected kids and communities instead of investing in after school programs and sports programs and theater and technology workshops and things like that to inspire them. We neglect kids because it's too expensive. And then 15 years later, we build a prison for them. We deal with, with all kinds of social and economic problems that are many times more expensive than the initial investments. So it's very important when we budget for these things to recognize that the cost of inaction is often much, much more expensive in the long term. And, and we pay for it with blood, tears, and money in, 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 in the true sense of the term. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much, Rahel. And I, I want to quickly, um, I'm just watch, keeping an eye on the time because I do want some time for, for open Q&A. Um, so it's really interesting because uh, many of the comments, there's been questions around, and I'll ask all three of you. So I'm, I'm ditching my wonderful plan of the wonderful questions I had planned for you, um, which is great because it's, you know, this has surfaced some very, very important things. And what I'm seeing in the chat, um, and again, I think it comes to this point around the pots, or I don't know how else we can, lenses, we often talk about a lens or the glasses you're wearing, um, is this, this real need to make sense of our current situation, what's happening at the moment, but also the need to reimagine. Um, and one of the questions I think I asked to all of you is who needs to be included in the conversation about rethinking economics in South Africa. Um, and in the chat, people have been asking, you know, are we still talking about capitalism here? Because if you're talking about growth, what do you mean? If we're talking about GDP, can we still use it? Is it a useful term? Is that what we should even be using as a term? Um, stranded assets, it's interesting because you can see, um, I didn't actually understand it and I, and I asked um, in another group when I read it, I was like, what's stranded assets? And the interesting thing here is that there and um, it's also again in the chat is this 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 the trade-offs and often when we start talking about nuclear energy or nuclear power we're often drawn to what has happened in Germany in relation to the shutting down or, or what are mothballing the, the the nuclear power stations and what does Nord Stream 2 mean in relation to that mothballing and the need for gas so um you know, but what are we talking about? Why do we need a Nord Stream 2 in the first place around consumption, demand? So I want to throw out a little bit the kind of messiness of this, of the practical, um, both the practical and the imaginary of, of, of how do we move away from being too dogmatic, but also able to really practically give a submission to the parliament and say, you know, when you look at this budget, think about these things. Practically. So, Sonia, you go first. I think I'll let Michael go first. <laughs> if, if you insist. 
Um, you know, the, the, uh, the budget, I mean, maybe, maybe, I don't know if this is, uh, let, let me share two th thoughts that came up as you were talking, uh, Toko, and also as Fadel was talking about the costs and the benefits. The, 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 the one is that uh, I, I have a sense that, so, so there's this rising price of carbon, which is uh, in a sense you can think of as the cost of generating carbon energy, carbon, carbon generation of energy or carbon intensive generation of energy. The cost of doing so is rising. And meanwhile, the cost of renewable technologies is falling. And the way I think we largely tend to think about the transition in South Africa is that we're going to be doing the same things in the same way, but we're just going to use a different technology to produce the energy. And the problem with that is that there's a third dimension that we need to take account with just the energy intensity of what we're doing. So, so what do we do? And as Fadel says, you know, we produce most of our, car our mineral and energy complex. What does it do? It produces exports that are consumed in, in the global north. In the, I mean, like platinum. What, what, why do people want platinum in Europe? It's for capital, it's so that they can meet their environmental goals. Uh, on their uh, for their catalytic converters on their cars on their petrol cars right so so we're producing the stuff exporting it there it's being consumed there but uh, so so now we tend to think of the transition as being we're still going to be producing and exporting platinum which is a highly labor intensive i mean sorry highly carbon intensive and increasingly capital intensive activity but we're going to do it with renewable energy. Instead of having some vision of actually what is our development path away from the mining sector or away from the dominance of the mining sector. So that's the one kind of thing that, that, that came to my mind. The second, you know, that, 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 and, and I was trying to hint at this at the beginning, we, we think of the transition or we've been told that uh, it's, it's net positive. So there are costs today, but the benefits tomorrow clearly outweigh uh, the cost today. And then also, as Fadel says, and, and, and it's something that is often argued is, don't forget the cost of inaction. Um, what we sometimes forget is that action also has cost. That there are two parts here. There's a, there's a cost of inaction, but there's also a cost of action. And you may find that the, the key issue is what is the, the incidence of those costs in time? So inaction uh, has high costs in the future, uh, whereas action has high costs in the present. And the more you go into the future, the more the distant the future is, the more difficult it is for people to take it seriously. So if so, so South Africa has just come out of a COVID crisis, which has substantially reduced employment in our economy, in the tourism sector, in the human intensive uh, uh, services. We are uh, on a fiscal path that means a contraction in public employment. For better, and I'm not saying we should or we shouldn't, I'm just saying with this, the central problem we have is employment. We've just had this big shock that has reduced employment and the fiscal path is looking to reduce employment more. Then you put it to me, should we accelerate the closing down of the coal sector? Knowing that that is gonna have huge impacts on employment. And the argument that, well, but there's gonna be climate jobs 20 years from now that are gonna, that, and it's a better development path it kind of doesn't help people in Mpumalanga. Uh, and, and, and this is a real problem, <laughs> is all I'm saying. So, and it links to, I think, what Sonia was mentioning earlier about the, 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 the idea of the Wall Street consensus and the idea of de-risking private investment, because ultimately there are very deep 
redistributive. Uh, ultimately, it's the sovereign, meaning that the, the nation that is taking on board these risks. Uh, and and, and they, 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 you know, if we're, if we're democratic, we, we should have a, a good understanding. So I, I maybe I'm, I'm just, because Sonia forced me to go first, now I'm forced to, uh, let me make one other point just in response to the chat. Uh, I, I, you know, there's this idea that we cannot uh, uh, avoid the climate catastrophe unless we transcend capitalism. And I, 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 that may well be true, but we should not be, you know, one of the, the central problems of socialism since the idea was first thought of is the idea of the transition away from capitalism. It's not a small problem. And, and I think, sim, you, you know, it's so easy and, and simple to, to just say, no, we have to abolish capitalism. Uh, it, that, that, it's not so easy to, to actually do it, you know, and, and we need to, and I saw Dick, I was very interested and I'll try and read uh, what Dick has posted there from John Bellamy Foster. I'm sure he's probably the go-to guy on this kind of stuff. But what does, so in a sense for a developing country like South Africa with this high unemployment and like there's capitalism, it kind of, you know, it has problems, but it kind of works or it has worked in to create jobs and full employment in the developed North. And we've, we've thought about development path as that if we're gonna go off in some uh, completely different path, uh, that, that's going to be very difficult. Or we need to think about it much more before we embark on that path, yeah. Thanks, Michael. Sonia, are you ready? I am, but it won't be a very long response. I, I you know, I, I agree that we, the danger is in, you know, brushing over kind of important trade-offs that we need to be honest about. Um, at, at the same time, um, I am still on the camp that inaction now is better than, you know, or rather inaction is worse than action now. The pain of inaction um, is far better than the pain of like, the pain of action. Oh my gosh, okay, I'm, I'm getting my words mixed up. But essentially what I'm saying is that I think, you know, Michael is in many ways, I think minimizing just the scale of the crisis as it is today. And I think the danger in inaction, um, in not doing anything currently, would be in minimizing just how big this problem is now. And so I would say it's, it's important that we do something now and that we work towards something um, as opposed to not doing anything because we're afraid of potential costs. It's, it, it is gonna be painful, but, it's, it's very painful now for many of South Africans. And I think we need to be real about that as well. Thanks, Sonia. Fadal, do you have a response? Oh, well, a response uh, folded into, you know, a few comments related to the conversation. Um, the first thing is, um, who are the, the, the key players that we need to bring into these conversations? And I think it's, you know, broadly speaking, it's really everybody. But fundamentally, when, when it comes to the issues that I was putting on the table today, uh, it's, it's key players within the South African context. That includes uh, labor unions, that includes uh, youth, that includes people who are thinking about uh, the transformation of, of the economy, uh, but not simply in the context of South Africa, because this, we're dealing with a global challenge. So it's about how do we transition away from fossil fuel-based economy, decarbonize without throwing workers under the bus. So the concept of a just transition, how do we identify very carefully the kinds of transferable skills that we can identify in existing jobs and create a pathway towards those new industries that we want to set up? How do we make sure that those industries not only have the pathway in terms of skills to transition workers, but also have the actual market dynamics that allows those industries to actually function? And here I'm referring to uh, what Michael was referring to earlier, which is 
not simply extractive industries, but transformative industries so that we scale up from low value added content of exports, the raw materials, towards higher value added content, which means building an industrial kind of horizontal linkage within the country and within the region so that you produce and, and retain the most of the value added of the production uh, for, for the global supply chain. We're not saying everything will be produced locally from start to finish, but at least you start climbing up that ladder. What are the skills needed? What are the technical uh, capabilities? What are the technological resources that you need to bring from, out, from the outside? And then how do you make sure that whatever you're producing is actually hitting the economies of scale to sustain that industry? And then finally, on the finance part of it, and, and this uh, relates to the conversation about is it private, is it public, is it PPP? To me, those are important conversations, but the most important factor here is the financing. Is it external financing or domestic financing? Does that mean that the government or the private sector is borrowing in dollars and euros to finance these uh, projects, in which case, you have to think very carefully project by project. Will the project itself be export oriented to actually pay for itself, to serve its debt? Or is it eventually gonna be the responsibility of the state? Because when a private entity is borrowing in dollars and committing itself to future uh, dollar payments externally, but it's producing primarily for the local market, like uh, energy, for example, or water, then eventually, that entity, even though it will be able to quote unquote pay its external debt, but that puts pressure on the value of the currency. So it, eventually it becomes the problem of the central bank to manage that pressure on the exchange rate. And eventually the government has to borrow to compensate for it. So these are very important factors to, 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 to keep in mind. And then on a, on a regional slash global scale, when we think about transforming the South African economy, we have to think of it in terms of the climate challenge that all other countries are facing. So engaging with countries on the, uh, on the continent, but also engaging with the global north to really start applying pressure on the global north to take responsibility, not only in terms of transfer of financial resources to accelerate the decarbonization, transfer of technology and building industrial capacity for that resilience without throwing workers under the bus, without producing a South African economy that doesn't produce enough energy for itself to, to accelerate the transition. So it really has to be a, a COP27 type of conversation with countries in the global north, global south, going into COP27 with a comprehensive vision for how to transform the economies in the global south in order to meet the, the climate challenge. And, and I think South Africa has a, a key role to play as, as a leader in, in the continent as a one of the leaders in the emerging uh, markets uh, system to rethink its own path to economic development and lead the way for the global south to, to, to really meet the challenge um, before the end of the century. Thanks Fadel. I, Michael, I see your hand up. Um, I'm just noting the time. And I, I do want to have one or two questions, Q and A's before we close. Um, so maybe Michael, you can give your input uh, with one of the questions uh, that comes up. So I want to open up for the for everyone. I mean, thank you so much for the input on the chat. I, I almost feel like we've got like a number of essays and positions that we could be taking. Um, uh, uh, I think um, you know forward. And I did say from the beginning that. You know, we have to be comfortable with unfinished business. Um, and I think the next step, which is part of this um, collaboration, is to invite speakers to come and talk over the year, two, next two years, um, as we really try and, and, and shape the conversation. Um, so if you would like to, to ask a question of the panel, before you do so, we've got a quick poll that's going to come up. So you can take a breath and think about your questions. And then to the panelists, um, <clears throat> what I would like to ask you to do is just to write down one question you're being left with as you leave this webinar. I mean, you've been under fire for more than an hour and a bit now. And uh, maybe this is a moment for you to take a, just a breather and to 
to um, kind of think, sure, what's my question? Because you've been, I gave you loads of questions. So for the participants, please fill out the poll, take a deep breath. Um, and if you do want to uh, ask a live question, um, just put your hand up and there's a team watching to look. And we have uh, about less than 10 minutes. Uh, Toko, as we as we think about these, uh, can I put an additional point on the table? Sure. So uh, I mentioned that uh, I, I agree with Michael that the the production side, the supply side, is extremely important here because it's not, it's not just about stimulating the demand side and and creating all the you know beautiful things we want to create. It's really can the economy handle the additional demand? Do we have the additional productive capacity for it? And for me, this becomes a key point when it comes to inflation, the risk of inflation. I, I said from the beginning, a Green New Deal has to spend with an eye towards the risk of inflation, the risk of these shocks to the system, currency depreciation, external debt, and, and so on. And inflation to me is the result of two um, uh, things. One is lack of productive capacity. The good news here is that productive capacity is producible. And it happens to create millions of jobs potentially if we have strategic investments that not only put the financing on the table, but also the technological capabilities uh, and, uh, and prepares the labor force to staff that productive capacity. So that's, that's that part we can handle with careful planning and careful thinking. Uh, the second source of inflation to me has to do with abusive market power. And that kind of... Uh, market concentration, whether it's from the state, whether it's from PPP, whether from external suppliers, whether it's from the people who get the commissions for importing the, the technology or importing the resources, that kind of inflation uh, can't be dealt with unless you have a state that is willing and able to tax and regulate market power out of existence to make those markets more democratic, more competitive. So antitrust laws, regulatory framework that really protects consumers and reduces that, that abuse. But the thing is, most of our thinking about inflation is usually handing the keys to the central bank to manage inflation. And when you look at South Africa or many developing countries, I'm originally from Tunisia, the actual sources of inflation are often imported. We import a lot of wheat, for example, in Tunisia from the Ukraine, uh, uh, coincidentally. Uh, and when you have a crisis in the Ukraine or when you have a global crisis in, in the wheat market with droughts in Russia and Ukraine and other places, we import more expensive wheat. Now, how does the Tunisian central bank raising interest rates in Tunisia going to solve the Ukraine crisis? How does the Tunisian central bank raising interest rates going to solve a conflict that involves OPEC countries related to energy imports from the Middle East or other places? So we have kind of uh, inflation pressure points that are way outside the jurisdiction of the central bank, and yet we focus on the central bank to solve it by raising interest rates. Where is the inflation pressure point? Identification is extremely important for us so that when we think about a Green New Deal that can exacerbate inflation pressure points, we need to spend with an eye towards taming the inflation pressure points, tax and regulate with an eye towards taming those inflation and pressure points. And that's typically the jurisdiction of parliament or the Senate or Congress or whatever political system we have. That is usually in the fiscal policy side of the equation, not necessarily in the monetary policy side. Monetary policy has a role to play, but it's not the singular entity that can make inflation go away with, with a simple kind of raising interest rates or, or, or anything like that. So that's something important. I wanted to make sure before we leave today to right. make sure that we, we're not going on a spending spree because we want to decarbonize, we want to do all the right things, and then neglecting what actually causes inflation and what can cause the currency depreciation and believing that the central bank can simply manage it. It's the yeah. fiscal authorities primarily with the strategic industrial policy and everything we've discussed today in terms of planning to build up that productive capacity carefully in the long term, that's how we actually tame the source of inflation, the risk to the exchange rate, 
uh, and avoiding a, an external debt crisis. Great, thanks Fadel. Um, Yvette, would you like to, I see your hand up. I'm going to get all the way. Hi. Hi, Toka, how are you? I'm good. Um, I'm, dod I, I I'm, I'm dodging you. <laughs> I, I wasn't actually going to speak. I was mainly here to gather information, but then, then questions arose that I felt qualified to, to, to respond to. So, so, so maybe just briefly, all these questions about how do we make the transition to, to a low energy economy and, and uh, does that look like capitalism? I just wanted to say that, 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 you know, so often in climate change, you first have to build the alternative and then go back and measure it because half the time, the, the, the thing that you want to know does not exist. So, so I did exactly that 10 years ago. I started a small organic soap company running on, on renewable energy and energy efficiency, um, you know, based on, on a, I, live on an organic farm. I farm organically as many inputs as I can. I buy in what I can. And um, and and so just for 10 years, I've been able to see, well, how, what are the answers to these questions? So the short answer is, um, firstly, because the company is indigenous knowledge system based. So we don't really spend much time training people. We start with the knowledge that they already have. And that's far from saying that people shouldn't have training in solar energy or whatever. That's just saying that, that the whole knowledge question and the kind of education we need is, is not always as obvious as it looks. Um, and secondly, well, would you describe me as a capitalist? I own my own means of production, but I have no employees. You know, there's family labor, I guess we're pretty bourgeois, um, but, but that works pretty well. And it gives me a, a political independence that I think the middle class hasn't had. I've been middle class all my life, but I spent, you know, the last three years standing outside parliament selling soap and holding up bars and saying, be clean, be clean, which was enormous fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> not just good for the planet, it was also fun. Yeah. Um, but, 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 but lastly, yeah, just, so just why my point about around inflation is we made a policy decision not to raise our prices this year. And that's because the lower we keep our prices, the more bulk we're able to obtain and that lowers our input costs. So again, I'm just wanting to suggest that a lot of these questions are not economic questions. They are very deliberate political choices. And, and I would commend that we direct our attention to the political. Yeah, right. sorry, but I just Thanks. wanted to add. Thanks, Yvette. Um, I'm, I'm being told, I'm being poked that we're running out of time. So there might not be an answer from the panelists, but this might be enriching for everybody. Um, the last person we're going to, sorry, just in terms of time will be Abdul Latif. Um, if you can ask your question and then we'll do a quick round response. Abdul Latif, you can go. Abdul Latif is still muted. You're muted if you're speaking. You need to unmute. No. Okay. So I'm afraid we're going to call it time. Um, and I wanted to ask in the last quick uh, moments, uh, quick go around, we have noted the questions that are in the, the chat. Um, it's going to be for the convening team to go back and rethink and see where, where next um, we're, we're going to go. Um, and I also just wanted to, to echo that there are many conversations taking place around alternatives. And um, it's beautiful to see how we bring together different spaces and the questions that get raised from the, the hyper micro level of this is a different way to live to what do we do with stranded assets. You know, we can, you know, I can make soap and live well and we need to deal with coal. So it's important that we embrace these different levels. So just thinking about that last question that you might have um, in, in your heads as the speakers and any closing uh, remarks. So I will pick the early riser first. That will be me. 
thank you. So uh, in, in closing, uh, uh, Toko, you, you asked us to um, comment on what inspires us to, to do this work in terms of uh, quotes or something like that. So I, I thought about it in one of the quotes that I uh, often uh, use in, in my work uh, is a reference to Martin Luther King in the context of the civil rights movement in, in the US. It wasn't the, the climate crisis uh, context, but it's, it's relevant and inspiring, where he said, I have no time for the tranquilizing drug of gradualism and incrementalism. Uh, and, and when you think about it in the context of the climate crisis, Yes, gradualism makes sense. And I grew up based on, on the philosophy of gradualism. I grew up in Tunisia and, and my father was a big fan of this you know, important quote from our first president in Tunisia, Bourguiba, who, who was a, a, a gradualist at the core. Uh, he, he was trying to make sure that the nation is patient with him in, in delivering results. Uh, so I grew up with, with the philosophy of gradualism, but I, I can't live with myself today without thinking in a, in a deeply radical transformative way. Radical and not in the political sense of the term, although it might be, but radical in the sense of going to the roots of the problem. Uh, and, and that's how I think about economic development. That's how I think about the, the climate crisis. Um, so I, I'd like us to be radicals uh, in, in, the, in the technical sense of the term and, and try to identify the structural, you know, underpinnings of our problems economically, ecologically, socially, and think long-term, how do we achieve those goals? How do we build a pathway for that transition without sacrificing quality of life, without sacrificing people and people's livelihood and, and so on? And in that uh, process, and because I talked about international cooperation is really important for this transformation on, on the continent, I'm also inspired by um, the Barbadian prime minister, the current one and the first uh, Barbadian prime minister, who in the context of uh, independence in the 1960s famously said, we're going to be friends of all satellites of none. And this is very important for us in the global south to recognize that transforming the way we uh, we operate our economies, decolonizing in a sense the, the economies and, and really uh, engaging with the global north as equal partners in this challenge is important uh, because otherwise if if we're if we're finding a partnership agreement for technological transformation that meets the challenge and it happens to be i don't know with russia with china with japan it shouldn't matter and if the global north doesn't like it maybe it should provide the alternative as opposed to keeping the global financial architecture international trade architecture as a status quo and saying let's figure out a different way to do this so we need to be brave enough to engage in these geopolitical transformations too as as countries from the global north not in an adversarial type of uh engagement with the global north, but with the, in an honest conversation about how we actually meet the climate challenge. And that can't be done under the current global financial architecture, international trade architecture. Um, so we, we have to change the world, essentially. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're not in the fullest sense of the term. And that yeah. means transforming our foreign policy re relations using economic diplomacy in a way that allows us to meet these, these challenges. So thanks, I'll leave thanks. it at that. Thanks, Wadal. Um, so between Michael and Sonia. I'll go first <laughs> um, because I'll, I'll likely be quite short. Um, you know, Togo asked, you know, one of her questions was who needs to be included in this conversation? And I think I would just like to reiterate what in these types of big conversations, I mean, um, and I would like to reiterate what, what Ayabong and Tawe always says, and that is that the economy is too important to be left to economists. Um, the economy affects us all, some far worse than others. And I think economists, of course, economists are not a homogenous group in South Africa, um, but we have give, been given too much space and power to talk authoritatively about the economy. Um, and if you think about it, the economy is merely, you know, a set of people making a set of decisions. And so I think who makes decisions is as important as what decisions are made. And so it's very important that those most marginalized are not given, are not only given a seat at the table, but are also given voice 
and decision-making power. And I'll end there. Thanks, Sonia. Michael. Yeah, I, I don't have an inspiring quote. Uh, I'm, a, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but let, let me, I, I wanted to make a substantive point earlier and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make it just because it's gonna help me think about it more. Uh, and that is uh, in relation to, to well, well Fadel said that we must, we, we must find domestic ways to finance. We, we, we must not finance, we must be careful about external financing. And uh, in the chat, Dick had made a point about domestic sources of finance, the GPF and, and the like. And I think it's important for us to realize that this is not only about, it's not only a financial question, it's also a macroeconomic question. In the sense that if you don't want foreigners to finance your investment, you have to shift from domestic consumption uh, and, and finance your investment by limiting your domestic consumption. Because if you don't do that, you will generate external imbalances and foreigners will have to finance your investment. And, there's, and I think that when we think about the climate transition in South Africa, there's, the, there's an issue of consumption that is at the center of it. And that is that we, because of our inequality, we have uh, two very large elements of consumption that drive our economy along a consumptive path and limit the scope for domestic investment or limit our ability to finance domestic investment. And those two elements of consumption are first, the one we always talk about is public consumption. Uh, and certainly, if we go down the kind of path that I'm suggesting, that, that will have to be thought about. But more important than that, in a sense, is private consumption of the affluent. That we have a small minority of the population that consumes huge resources uh, on par with elites in the developed world. And so uh, going back to what Yvette was saying is that, that this then becomes a political challenge that how do we begin to raise the issue of limiting the consumption of elites in South Africa in order to finance this, this transition is going to be a very difficult question. So and I'm that was yeah. just, so Perfect. thank you. And, and I've really enjoyed this. And I, I don't have an inspiring quote. You, but you, I gave, to, you just gave an inspiring quote. How do we get rich no, people to pay to for the new deal? I wanted to pick up another one. I wanted <laughs> to pick up on another Wait, wait, quote. no, no. I, time, 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 time. Okay, Very short, so, Very no, short. No, I'm, I'm, I'm put it in the chat. I'm under strict, these collaborate, people we're collaborating with are tough. Salim, over to you. Uh, I was uh, sorry that Michael uh, cannot say his last word, but I'm sure. Well, my we'll last be... words, I will impinge on Salim's time to say, you know, <laughs> Mark said, Mark said uh, uh, the philosophers have only interpreted the world or only analyzed the world. The point is to change it. I agree, but he did not say that you should not analyze it before you try and change it. And I think we need a lot more of this type of analysis uh, to define our path of change. Uh, for, for, the, for the sake of the audience, I've donated my one minute to Mike, and I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank uh, Fadil, uh, Sonia, and Michael, and particularly Togo and uh, uh, the team at Heinrich Bull Foundation. Uh, I know Karen was also involved in, and others. Um, so just to say it, it's really superb to listen to three brilliant brains uh, and uh, just to give us a sense in, in, of a, what I think is going to be a very important debate going uh, into the future. It's not The future has not ended. The future has begun. And uh, we Look forward to more engagements with you. And I just want to thank also my team, Kelly and others uh, who helped to, to pull this together. So from our side, uh, we want to say, let's have a good weekend. Uh, we'll take more quotes uh, offline and uh, look forward to more engagements uh, in the future. Thank you very much.